1. This happened in January a year and a half ago, on my way into work one cold, wintry Friday morning. I had a rough start that day. I remember waking up in a panic as I realized that I was holding my phone in my hand and had been hitting snooze in my alarms for the last hour. I wasn't even giving them a chance to sound. Apparently, as soon as my phone started to vibrate, which it does a second or so before the music begins to play, I would hit the side button to silence it. I was exhausted. I had already worked Monday to Thursday, ten hour days that typically turn into twelves at that time of the year, and I had just found out that I was pregnant a week prior. So I was even more tired than normal, and this type of behavior was very unlike me. I'm always on time to work. I don't usually work on Fridays, but once a year we have our annual mandatory training for all staff members. It's definitely not a day that can be missed or one to be extremely late to. So I quickly throw on some clothes, tie my hair up into a ponytail and brush my teeth. Then out the door I went. I had 25 minutes until I had to be there, so I didn't even let my car warm up. As I pulled out of my driveway, I remember thinking to myself that my dad would kill me if he knew. He's a mechanic, and that was something he always preached the importance of. I finally get out of the neighborhood, hit the highway, and notice that my gas light is on. Another annoyance that would cut into my time, but I decided that I would stop once I got off the exit, as I had a few minutes to spare. So I did. I pull my car up to the pump and turn it off, hop out into the freezing cold to get the gas started, and quickly jump back in. There's a guy, about my father's age, pumping gas into his white work truck right in front of me, but I don't really pay him much mind. Those trucks were everywhere near my workplace at the time, as it's near the river where all the bridge construction had been going on. I'm texting my friend from work and letting her know where I am, when I get that feeling someone is looking at me. I look up and make eye contact with the work truck guy. He quickly looks away as I hear the gas click off. I get back out to finish and I don't think anything else about it, and then hop back in ready to get to work. At this point I probably had about five minutes left, which would have been plenty considering the proximity. I press the start button, click click click, shit I thought, as I did it again, only to hear the same sound. What do you know, my car won't start. Battery's dead, and for the second time that morning, I thought of my dad and his advice. If I would have just let it warm up, I wouldn't be having this problem right now. I try for a third time, hoping it's a charm, but it's no use. The guy in the work truck notices at this point. He starts to make his way towards me, so I step out of my car. He asks me if I'm having car trouble, and I tell him that I think my battery's dead. He tells me that he can help me, but he doesn't have jumper cables in this particular truck. He does, however, only work right down the road. He's on one of the bridge crews, just as I assumed, and has a set there. He says he will run to get them and come right back. I tell him that he doesn't have to do that, but he says he doesn't mind at all. I think about it for a second. My husband's at home, already asleep at this point. He works third shift and I don't want to wake him up if there's no need. And my dad's already at his job. I remember thinking that he probably has a kid my age somewhere, one who he would hope someone would help in this type of situation one day. That he's probably just a father trying to help, so I say, okay, and thanked him for his help. He said no problem that he'd be back in a couple of minutes and left to get the jumper cables. I usually have a set in my car, but had loaned them to my brother the week before and he hadn't returned them yet. As I'm waiting, I called my boss to let her know what was going on and that I would be in as soon as possible. She offers to send someone out there to help, but I tell her about the work truck guy and that I'll call her back if this doesn't work. By the time I hang up, he's back with the cables and we get my car started back up again. We let it run for a few minutes and make small talk. That's of little importance, like typical strangers do when they're trying to fill the silence. It's during this time that he asks me if I'm a nurse. Immediately I'm alarmed because I'm not wearing any scrubs. I think I can see the shock in my face because he quickly said that he noticed my license plate when he was pulling back in. I laugh in relief and slight embarrassment as I remember that my license plate is in fact one of the state-issued nursing ones and reply that yes, I'm a nurse and I'm actually running late for work. He asks if I worked at the hospital up the road to which I reply that no, I do not. Now he's the one that looks confused because where else would a nurse work, right? 
I don't want to give too much away. I'm still a woman, and I watch the news. And I feel a little uncomfortable with the questions, but I don't want to be rude. So I say, oh, I work at a facility not too far from here and leave it at that. I mention again how I'm running late, and he unhooks the jumper cables. I thank him again, and we both get in our vehicles and drive away. I let him pull out first, and then I proceed to take a roundabout way to work, just in case he was watching. I felt kind of silly, but you never know, right? I finally get to work, and I jump straight into the training. I honestly don't think about what happened that morning again. Except here and there, when my co-workers ask a few questions in the break room during lunch. The long day finally comes to an end, and we all head out. As I'm walking towards my car, I see a piece of paper shoved down into the driver's side window. I stand there and look at it for a second, thinking of the guy from that morning, and then glance around the parking lot. I don't see anything unusual, and remind myself that he didn't know where I worked. I laugh for being so paranoid, because it's probably a note from my best friend, who actually does work at the hospital a few blocks over. We leave each other notes occasionally, if we see each other's car as we drive by. I started it back when she was going through a rough time the year before, and it just kind of became our thing. As I'm sure you can guess, the note wasn't from her. It was from the work truck guy from that morning. I don't remember it all word for word, but most of it I know I'll never forget. It made my skin crawl and thoroughly freaked me the hell out. It listed his phone number at the top with an arrow pointing to it that said, Call soon, love. It said that he felt we had this connection, one of two souls, and that he wanted to continue getting to know me. That he knew the reason why he was at that gas pump in front of me that morning was it so he could find me because the Lord knows he had been searching for me for so many years now. That he couldn't just let me slip away. We couldn't ignore fate like that. No. Not when it had been made as clear as it was that morning. I dropped that piece of paper like it was on fire, felt my heart drop with all the panic and paranoia that came after reading it. I was so freaked out that I immediately called my mom, my dad, and my husband. I didn't want to drive home. What if he followed me? Did he not see my wedding ring? How did he even find out where I worked? He literally had to have driven through about 20 other medical facility parking lots just to find my car. Because I watched him drive off in the other direction and never saw him turn around in my rear view. Trust me, I was watching. My work building is kind of hard to find too with it being off the main road on a side street. Especially for a man that lived a couple hours north from here as he told me earlier during our small talk. He wouldn't have been familiar with the surrounding areas enough to just come upon my car like that. I didn't walk in or out of work by myself for months after that. Not until after the bridge was finished. It's always night time when I arrive at work and, or part of the year when I leave, so there was no way in hell that I was going to walk across that dark parking lot by myself. I've never seen him again, but that hasn't stopped me from feeling like someone is watching me at random times. That type of paranoia just sticks with you. If only I had just listened to my dad's advice and let the damn car warm up. But that's a mistake I have not, and will not, ever make again, I can guarantee it. So to the creepy guy my father's age who thought it would be appropriate to hunt down my car after helping me, let's never meet again. 2. This happened a few years back, but it still gets me. I'm an American living in France. At the time of this incident, I was working in a hotel kitchen for a five-star hotel. I had to drive 30 minutes, catch a 30-minute metro, and then walk another 10 minutes to get to and from this hotel. I'd work from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day. The boss was a dick. And the customers were uppity fuckers who thought that five-star meant the staff are not human. Basically, it sucked. One day I was having a particularly shitty shift. My hair was gross, my face was numb from smiling at rude customers, and all I wanted was to go home, take a shower, and go to sleep. So I put my earphones in and waited for the metro. At this stop it was super busy, so the metro opened from both doors, letting people get on one side and off the other. The rest of the stops weren't as busy, so they only opened on the opposite side so people could get out. 
When the metro arrived, I stepped on and stood next to the door that wouldn't open again, knowing I could lean back for the rest of the trip. Then a man in an electric wheelchair rolled on, and he stopped just in front of the same doors I was planning to lean against. He had a couple of bags hanging from the back of his chair, and he wasn't pulled up enough so the doors would shut on his bags. I knew the doors would close and remain closed, so instead of just telling him to pull up a bit, I held the bags forward a bit so they wouldn't get caught in the door. The door closed, I let go, and the guy smiled at me. Then he started talking to me. I had my earphones in so I couldn't hear what he said. I was exhausted. But I'm a nice person so I took them out and talked to him. He clearly had a disability as his speech was pretty hard to understand. My French isn't bad, but it wasn't good enough to understand him. So I told him, I'm sorry, I don't speak French. He immediately switched to English. Fuck, I thought, but again, I'm nice, so I kept talking to him. It was a normal conversation. Where are you from? What are you doing here? How long have you been here? Yada, yada, yada. Then he said, You're beautiful. Are you getting off at X? I was a little weirdy tight, but I said, No, I'm getting off at W, which is one stop before. He said, Get off at X with me. You can come over and we can hang out. I politely declined and he said, Kiss me. Fuck it, I thought. I said no and put my earphones back in, ignoring him. He kept talking, but I couldn't hear him, and I was blatantly ignoring him. Then he pushed a loud buzzer on his chair to get my attention. Everyone was looking at us now, and I would have looked like an asshole if I kept ignoring him, so I pulled my earphones out and he kept trying to talk to me asking me if I had a boyfriend, if I wanted to be his girlfriend, if I would kiss him. Keep in mind that I'm like 20 at this point, and he's a solid 50. Finally, my stop arrives, I say goodbye, and he rolls out of the metro with me. I told him this wasn't his stop, and he said, I'm coming home with you. I was thoroughly creeped out, but I figured I could ditch him easily at this point. We were two floors underground, and I could easily run up the stairs before he could get on the elevator. Feeling like a complete douche for trying to ditch a disabled guy, I stick to my plan, sprinting up the stairs, tripping a few times as I do. I get up to the ground floor and walk outside, satisfied that he's gone. As I'm walking to my car, I hear that buzz, he's behind me, zooming pretty fast after me. I start running, terrified of this dude who will not leave me alone. I get to my car, and I'm so freaked out that my hands are shaking, and I have trouble getting the keys in the car. Finally, I do. I hop in and put it in reverse. When I check the mirror, there he is, parked behind my car and buzzing at me. I don't know what to do at this point. I can't reverse and run him over. I'm certainly not getting out to talk to him, but I have to get home so I can't just sit there all day. This standoff lasted for ten minutes before he finally just rolls away, glaring at me as he does. I peel out of there and drive home. Shaken, but... Satisfied that I'd seen the last of this guy. The next morning as I pull into the parking lot, still sleepy but ready for work, I get out of the car, get down to the metro, and there he is, waiting on the platform. I'd forgotten that the day before I told him I work every day from 3am to 3pm. So he knew I would be there, and he knew when. He smiled when he saw me and started rolling over. I book it back up the stairs, calling my boss on the way, and telling him I'll be a little late to work. I end up just driving into the city, wasting gas and spending a ton of money on parking. I haven't seen him again, and I've since started going to a different metro station. There are a few other stations that I can park at, but they're sketchy as fuck. This guy had very limited movement, he could only use his fingers enough to move the chair, so I know there's probably nothing he could have done to hurt me, and he was probably just a lonely guy who wanted someone to talk to. But I still panic every time I see a wheelchair. 3. Sarge, at the time boyfriend, and I were visiting Russia together. We had seen his hometown before, but we were in a different undisclosed city, town, and area. It was snowing, of course, as in Russia, but we were still walking around. It was like a cultured village, but a little more modern. It was rustic. That's the word. So the snow obviously doesn't bother anyone there. Anyone except for me. Sarge has a couple layers on, sure, but I'm bundled up as if we're in a blizzard. Even Comrade, service dog from Russia, was fine. He wasn't shivering at all, and believe me, I was checking. 
We ended up going into this cute diner-type establishment that serves stuff like mostly soup and sandwiches. But it's not like I could read the menu, so I just told Sarge to order me whatever he was having and I would be good. We were sitting there for a while, just chatting away about the shit Sarge used to do as a kid. It's irrelevant, but here's one I distinctly remember if you're interested. When Sarge was like ten or so, he built a bunch of snowmen in his yard that were like three or four feet tall. Then the neighborhood jerks from down the street came marching and kicked all his snowmen down. Pissed off, Sarge rebuilt them after they left and poured lots of water on them so they turned completely to ice. When the bullies came back again, one went to kick one of the snowmen and screamed in pain with a broken foot or toe. Sarge's mother was about to punish him, but his father was too proud to let her do that. Anyway, just as we got our food, this big group of people came in and sat in the tables and booths to our left. These people were evidently Serbian. When Sarge told me that quietly, I asked, How do you know? They sound Russian to me. Yes, yeah, Slavic accents sound really similar, but if you're Slav, you can tell the difference. Okay, babe, but why are we whispering? Because they are in me. And since we both know ASL, American Sign Language, I taught him myself, he fingerspelled M-O-B. The what? Sarge mouths and finger spells. Mob. Oh, like that. And I finger spell M-A-F-I-A. Sarge responds. M-A-F-I-A is the Italian M-O-B. Oh, that makes sense. So we're sitting next to the Serbian mob. And on the other side, some normal wholesome Russians. We're, we're gonna be good, yeah? Well, of course, there are mostly Russians in here. They wouldn't try anything. So we're eating a little, and Sarge isn't nervous or tense at all, but I am. He doesn't seem phased at all to be sitting next to the mob, but the Russians on the other side of us keep eyeing the Serbs every now and then. Like they're a little stressed. The Serbs are a bit rowdy, kinda loud. Mostly 99% men, nice clothes, smoking. I have something known as Foreign Accent Syndrome, FAS, which causes me to unintentionally mimic other accents I hear, or just start speaking ones at random. This time, I was getting a Serbian one by sitting next to the Serbs. Again, I thought in my head it was just a Russian one from talking to Sarge. That still happens today. I'll be living my life and then randomly have a Russian accent from Sarge. I thought at the time that's what this was. As it was getting stronger and Sarge could hear it, he says, Stop talking. Huh? Shh. I look at him and I'm saying, What the hell is your problem? He responds in sign language saying you sound Serbian. I give the oh shit look. Don't worry about it. As long as you just sign instead of talk, maybe calm down so your accent goes away, you'll be fine. Don't worry, love. In my head, I'm still worried because Sarge isn't fluent in sign language yet. He knew enough at the time, but he wasn't great. At this time, Comrade is now starting to get a little antsy under the table, sensing my anxiety. So I get to pet him, and it makes me feel better. Sure enough, the server comes over and asks something. Sarge translates and asks me, Do you want anything to drink? I don't drink, and I still don't drink, really, but I wanted to try kvass. For the hell of it. I fingerspell kvass, but he doesn't get it. He keeps asking me to repeat it, and I keep going slower and slower, and eventually I get so stressed between everything that I just end up saying, KVASS spells kvass, honey! He goes a little pale. Someone from the Serb side goes, Hey! Something in Serbian that Sarge translated later for me. She's one of us. This is roughly the conversation. None of it was in English, so while this was happening, I was just sitting there all dumb. Sarge translated later. Mind your business. She is our business. She is Serbian. She's American. Now go back to your meal. Who are you to talk to me like that? Our server responds. We can ask you the same thing. This American you speak of with the perfect Serbian accent, a likely story. Serb guy number two is triggered. And if you know what's good for you, you'll apologize, suka. Bitch, slut, you get the idea of the word. The entire Russian side of the restaurant is triggered. Now it becomes a swearing match between the Serbs and Russians. It's not even about me anymore. Thank God. About three minutes later, the war is still going strong, and I really have to pee. The problem, Sarge doesn't want me to leave his site for obvious reasons. 
but it's not like the mob would let him get up and walk me to the bathroom, since he was the one who kind of helped instigate this whole thing. A few more servers come in from the back and try to defuse the situation and throw the Serbs out. They are not having it. I'm about to seriously pee my pants, so I go YOLO mode and just get up with Comrade during all the chaos and slip into the bathroom. After I relieve myself, I'm thinking, you know what, I'll just stay here until Sarge comes and gets me, and we can make a run for it. Or maybe I'll wait for the mob to leave. Waiting out in the bathroom didn't sound like a bad strategy at the time. I grab my phone and text this to Sarge, but... But... I fucking left my phone on the fucking table! Of all the times to not have my phone. I try to come up with a new plan. There's no way in hell I can just waltz back out there. Should I try to get outside? No, that's probably stupid, right? Well, I was stranded in there. Someone else comes into the bathroom. I hear a very heavy Russian accent say, Excuse me, ma'am? I poke my head out of the stall. It's a server. Apparently Sarge asked her to help with the 7% English she knew. She gives me my phone and I start rampantly text messaging Sarge. The lady, I'll call her Olga, sorry, it's the most Russian name I can think of, starts saying, So... Are you scared of Serbs? Not until now, should I be? My best friend Luna and her boyfriend Peter are both Serbian. Peter grew up with Sarge in Russia, though. Luna and I met in 7th grade, and the rest is history. They are terrific people. No, Serbs and Russians are usually like family. But these bastards are mafia. I decided then that I really liked Olga. We started playing with Comrade to pass the time. And eventually Sarge came to the bathroom and we sped walked out of the restaurant, while other servers kept the mob members from leaving and following us. Then we left. Later Sarge acted like it was no big deal and it never even happened. The hell? Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 408. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. I was having too much fun with that last story. I was expecting the dog to bark so I could bark in Russian, but ah oh well. We can't have everything. Oof, oof. The good news is, as of recording this, which I'm doing on a Friday, I got that package that the Royal Mail failed to deliver, uh, and I got it on the day the 21st. It should have been here on the 10th. <sighs> Just it's. I just wish no one would use Royal Mail to deliver anything but but letters. It's fine if it's letters. If it'll go through your letterbox, it's fine. Anything else, you're not going to get it first time. And it's not even like the sorting office where they expect you to expect you to go and pick it up if you don't have it re-delivered. It's convenient because they close at midday or one o'clock depending on the day. And it would be nice if they stayed open late. Maybe one day a week. Stayed open but four or five. Just one day a week. Only time they do that is Christmas time. Okay, that's enough grumbling. I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>